Thank you. Well, that was louder than I expected. Is that okay? <laughs> so I didn't expect to have a stage today, but I'm going to try and, and live up to it. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit today from perspective, if you like, of a, of a provocation. So we, we often talk about digital skills, and aren't they wonderful, and we should all have more of them. Um, I want to kind of nudge us a little bit out of our comfort zone. I'm going to do a little bit of nudging. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the student experience survey that just does as a little annual exercise. We've got some very interesting results back um, from, from doing that, particularly this year. And then, having given you a little bit of a nudge, let you go back into your comfort zone. I'm going to try and give you a great big shove into the unknown. So I'm going to do that for about 20 minutes and hopefully line up a few topics for us to talk about as, as the morning goes on. But first things first, I don't know if anybody knows what the, what the image on that title slide is. What do you think that might be? CubeSat. Yeah, so it's a CubeSat, and this CubeSat is from a project from the University of Surrey called Remove Debris, and the whole purpose of it is to clear up space junk. So think about this, this is a bit of British space tech, and we often don't think um, particularly that we were active in this area, you know, space is something that Californians do, it's not something that that British people do. So we, we built that satellite, and that is going to hopefully be the beginning of a whole new uh, space industry, space garbage collection. You know, it's not particularly romantic, it's not quite the same as flying to Mars or what have you. But that's a British thing. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. In the context of digital skills, when we talk about digital skills, we tend to talk about quite mundane things. We talk about, you know, oh, maybe you should set up a blog. You know, let's get people on social media. It's very easy to fall into that trap, I think. And, and that's why I want to give you that, that nudge or possibly a shove. So I've got three parts to this. Um, first part, I wanted to encourage us to think a little bit about what, what are those digital skills, really? What are the digital skills that you need to make a garbage-collecting cube set? And this, this is a real thing, you know, it's coming out of the research domain into product development, it's coming into commercialization. It's a real thing, and people are going to want to work on that. Um, not just that, I'll talk about some other stuff too. I'll say a few words about the uh, student experience survey, and there's some particularly interesting um, headlines that came out of it. I know some of you here have been involved in that. So you, you may wish to set me straight on a couple of things. Um, and I'm going to give you that really big show, and I'll, I'll keep, that, keep that for a little bit later on. So I'm going to leave you wondering what the big shove might be. So what are digital skills? Well, I want to set it in the context of, of where we want to be, rather than our kind of day-to-day -day processes and habits and routines. So where do we want to be? If you listen to uh, Klaus Spark, the uh, chair of the uh, World Economic Forum, and he would say, well, actually, well, increasingly we're seeing uh, pervasive connectivity, computerization. It won't be long before just about everything you can think of has a chip in it. You know, all these chairs will be chipped so that we know what the occupancy of the room is, things like that. Um, artificial intelligence, robotics, all these things um, of course, it's a continuum. Some of these technologies are further advanced than others. Some of them are finding their way into our daily lives. Artificial intelligence, for instance, a lot of the apps that we use on our phones right now use AI in ways that's often almost invisible to us. So on one hand, it feels quite futuristic, feels a little bit sci-fi, it's, you know, it's five years away, 10 years away. Then you pick your phone up and it's right there in your hand. So we have a little bit of a dichotomy there. Um, University of Oxford famously did this research that says actually, you know, here's the, here's the likelihood that your job is going to be automated. Watch out if you're a, a paralegal. Watch out if you're an accountant. I, I would take issue with that, but, you know, that, there we are. That's their research. A lot of jobs do involve a, a certain amount of 
repetitive processes, doing the same thing again and again and again. But maybe you do need to have gone and got an accountancy qualification before you can really do that job. Maybe you do need that domain expertise, but maybe there are significant aspects of your job that could be done by a robot. But I prefer, or an AI, I prefer Gartner's version of this. So Gartner said, well, every other industrial revolution that we've had has actually massively improved people's living standards, it's created new opportunities for people. And okay, there was disruption, and disruption is kind of inevitable, but ultimately, if you like, the robots are here to give us a promotion. So I'm gonna go with that because it would be quite downbeat to start the day off and go, well, actually, you know, we're all in trouble here. <laughs> um, so the robots are here to give us a promotion, but actually, we've got a, a little bit of a, a challenge ahead of us because um, as individuals, as institutions, I don't think we're quite set up for this near future. Um, we've got the Industry 4.0 agenda in, in the workplace, in industry, but we've also got this question about, well, how do we prepare our learners for that near future workplace? And can we use some of these techniques and technologies better in our institutions? So we have um, quite a few people are doing uh, learning analytics right now, where um, increasingly we're using machine learning, we're using AI technologies to try and predict uh, disengagement to um, get human beings to do something about um, dropout rates, interventions, mental health and well-being. Um, but just we think probably the, the, the way to approach this is actually to take a kind of concerted response and we're calling that education 4.0. Basically, how does education respond to industry 4.0? We're not the only people who are talking about this, but we think that there's a, a conversation to be had, uh, particularly with our members, UK universities and colleges. But what about those near future careers and actually what digital skills might you need? And I've put a few of them up on the slide here. Um, sound, sound a bit way off, don't they? Asteroid mining. DNA editing. <coughs> this sounds pretty sci-fi. Actually, these are all current careers. These are jobs that you can apply for right now. You can actually go to a site called planetaryresources.com, which is a VC-funded asteroid mining startup. So these are real things. Uh, if I'm someone who's starting a degree at one of our institutions, or started, let's say I started in October, um, Quite a few of these things weren't on anybody's radar when the course that I started was conceived. And some of the skills that I might need to actually execute on one of these uh, jobs is quite a bit beyond setting up a blog, getting on social media. I mean, all of these things are quite worthwhile. When I talk about the, the student experience survey, you'll see that actually a lot of our students aren't getting that far. So we might say, well, actually, we want you to engage more with the tech and the potential of it. You'll be surprised when you see uh, how little engagement there actually is right now. But anyway, those are near future careers that aren't actually that far in the future. They're quite close to us. And for some people, coming out of university, let's say coming out of university next summer, you know, these, these are viable career options. So how can we bridge the gap between where we are now and somebody who wants to pick up one of these, these career options. Another example, uh, UK spaceports. So we're actually going to be launching stuff like that CubeSat from Surrey into space from the far north of Scotland. And already government and industry have put 40 million in to setting up a, a spaceport right at the top of Sutherland. So that's the kind of uh, northwest tip of the, of the mainland. So this is going to happen. Brexit might slow it down. It's going to happen. I uh, mentioned Hyperloop. So Hyperloop's the futuristic high-speed travel network. It may, may it happen in tunnels. It may happen in, in tubes. Um, but it's being built. Again, there are a consortia around the world who are starting to build Hyperloops. And if it takes off in the UK, this is the UK design, you'll be able to get from London to Edinburgh in about three quarters of an hour. But to do this, to build this, we need people with advanced digital skills. And I'm not talking about blogging, I'm not talking about creating PowerPoint slides, I'm talking much deeper than that. 
So that kind of move on to what students are telling us. So this is some of the feedback from the student experience survey. Uh, I wanted to kind of kick off this bit with this um, headline from Sam Gima. So Sam very kindly wrote the introduction to the student experience uh, write-up. And he's basically said, um, in the nicest possible way, get it sorted. And, you know, if you're, if you're the minister, get it sorted comes implicitly with an or else. We need to do something about this. Um, th this is a very good response rate. 37,720 students at 83 universities and colleges. Only 41% of them said that they felt that um, their course was preparing them for the digital workplace. So that's, that's less than half, less than half. So we've got, a, we've got a job of work to do. And as a member organization, at just we want to do what we can to help people to bridge that gap. And using tools and technologies from folk like Adobe to see how we can do it. But what did students actually tell us? Well, some of these answers, quite surprising for me. I tend to think that students nowadays, um, the, the dreaded digital natives, um, would just routinely collaborate online. I know you probably can't make out all the numbers there. The, the bottom circle that says 21%, 21% is the uh, number of HE students who just did not collaborate online with other students. So we give people tools like Google Docs, we give people tools like Dropbox. And actually, there's a significant proportion of our students who uh, either don't feel that those are the tools for them, they can't get to grips with them, maybe they needed some support to get to grips with them. And a fifth is quite a lot. We ask people, we ask people about how this impacts on their course experience, and around half of the students felt that the learning spaces that they um, study in right now, well, they're not really that great. And so half of them said, yeah, they're really well designed, everything is fine. The other half, hmm. And I think we have to ask ourselves, in 2018, tiered lecture theatres seating for several hundred, uh, potentially as many as 500 people in one gigantic room, is this really what we want to do? And remember, this is my provocation. You can, you can fire it back at me and say, well, it's worked for a thousand years, so you know, let's not throw it away tomorrow. But is this really what we want to do? And the evidence from the students is, actually, we're not getting it right. There is, there is an impedance mismatch. Um, so we talked about that, that headline statistic, 41% of students <coughs> said they felt that their, their course hadn't really, um, sorry, 41% of students felt their course had prepared them for the digital workplace. Um, the other thing that's very interesting to me is 69% um, of HE students felt that digital skills would be important for their career. So there's a recognition that digital skills are important. When you look at um, the employer's perspective, um, the um, small small businesses and um, the CBI, what we're hearing is actually digital skills are super important, probably up to the level of around 85% of new roles requiring a significant element of digital skills. So again, there's a little bit of an impedance mismatch. Um, we kind of need to support students better. And I thought it was very telling that uh, Forty percent of students in HE and FE said that they had regular opportunities to review and update their digital skills. Forty percent. So two thirds felt that they didn't. Is their institution actively supporting them in developing digital skills? Is there a program? Who owns it? Where do you go? I think who owns it, particularly with the, the audience that we have today, I think you guys can ask yourselves that question, you know, do, is it my responsibility? If I'm a, a PBC for teaching, a provost for teaching, is this me? Does it sit somewhere else? Is it IT? Hmm, maybe not. Is it the library? Hmm, maybe. 
does it sit anywhere right now? Where should it sit? So how am I doing here? Good, good. So a couple, couple more things to throw at you, and then I'll let you get discussing. So I want to give you a big shove, and I kind of prepared you for that earlier on. Um, we talk about digital skills often in a, in a little digital skills bubble, in, in uh, a space which is kind of almost all its own. So I wanted to throw a few of the other bigger things that are happening, societal things, socio-technical developments. So the biggest one, of course, is climate change. And climate change could have quite drastic effects. Not tomorrow, not next year, but 5, 10, 15 <coughs> years. A lot of the things that we take for granted about where students are coming from, how they study, um, may change quite dramatically. I, I mentioned Brexit earlier on, and nobody winced, so I'm going to mention it again. Brexit could, on its own, have a massive impact on that. Um, this is the Larsen ice shelf breaking off from Antarctica. So this is um, satellite imagery over about a 10-year period. You can see climate change happening, and that's a thing that our, our kids are growing up with today. They're growing up with things like this. You can see the Northwest Passage in the far north of Canada clearing of ice so that shipping can use it for the first time. This is climate change happening in real time. What effects will it have? Well, it will mean that there will probably be all kinds of changes to migration patterns. We may see more talk of walls being built as climate refugees uh, trying to make their way across the planet to find a habitable space. We may see much more down-to-earth effects that we um, are st perhaps starting to see a few half inches of already. Things like um, increased levels of extreme weather, things like flooding for low-lying areas. And all these things are very, are very important. We can actually do something about them, but at the same time, a lot of the values that institutions, universities, colleges, schools, a lot of those progressive values that we, that we think our institutions stand for are increasingly being challenged. And sometimes they're being challenged by people who are, let's say, simply trolling online. Everybody's seen a few social media trolls. But now we have the spectre of the, the so-called advanced persistent threat. What happens when nation states try to destabilize each other uh, through the, the tools and techniques of online communication. And I was dissing social media earlier on, but I was doing that for a very particular purpose, which was to steer it back to this slide. How do we know whether the things we're reading online are really true? And there's some great research by Pew, who, which found that actually the kids are all right. Kids generally get it. The younger you are, the more likely you are to recognize if someone's trying to influence you, steer your opinion. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the older you are, it's a, it's a bit like the Fox News effect, the older you are, the less likely you are to have been exposed to the fact that there are all these people trying to influence you, trying to scam you, trying to steer you in one direction or another. And there's this uh, fantastic theorem called the paperclip maximizer, which says, what, what would happen if you trained an AI, in this case, to make paper clips? And it exhausts its sources of raw materials, so it starts looking around, is there anything in metal I can melt down to make more paper clips? And it's a bit like that with online advertising. We've created a, a monster for ourselves by saying we're going, to, we're going to optimize for engagement. We want to get the most clicks. We want to get the most likes, the most shares. And that drives some of the most extreme views and, and extreme viewpoints. So I think as part of our, as part of our imaginary, or hopefully becoming a reality and a program of, of digital skills, information literacy, disambiguation, what's true and what isn't, is hugely important. And the truth is, we're in a bit of a dark place right now because um, in, many, in many nation states around the world, our political leaders actually are saying things like Viktor Orban in Hungary said, oh, actually, the end of liberal democracy, it's finally here. It's so good to get shot of that. What we need is strong leaders, strong leaders who will put their foot down and frankly lock up uh, anybody who disagrees with them. 
This is not a place that we want to be. And there is a question for us, and alongside that information literacy question, progressive values, institutions, universities, are we the guardians of progressive values? And if we are, when those are increasingly under attack, how do we respond? So one final thought from me is that we talk about digital skills, but actually in the UK, particularly in England, we have a real problem with much more fundamental stuff. And I pulled this from the Evening Standard the other day. Um, key stage two test results are through 11-year-olds. There are parts of the country where half the kids can't read and write properly. <coughs> and the headline stat is actually overall, we're doing much better. Because actually overall, it's, it's now down to about a third. And, and it was overall, a few years ago, it was about 50-50. But there are parts of the country where 50% of our kids are coming through school. They've reached that critical point where they should be transitioning to secondary school and they can't actually um, read and write properly. They're not functionally literate and numerate. We want to do digital skills. We've got a massive challenge ahead of us. Let's see what we can do to help those kids. Uh, I, was very, um, I was very kindly allowed to use this image by uh, Simon Stalenhardt <coughs> which could be, on the one hand, it could be a piece of futuristic machinery, maybe one of those space gadgets I was talking about earlier on. And the kid is there going, Phew. how? How could I ever learn how that works? How could I work with it? How can I do stuff with it? But it could also be one of our institutions acting as a sort of portal and gateway onto all of those near future careers and all of those ideas and the imagination that hopefully we can, we can stimulate in our learners if we go about it the right way. I've put the prompts for today's discussion up if you want to leave them up, but that's been me. Thank you very much.